Hi there, I'm Peter Mumby. I'm a coral reef ecologist at the University of Queensland and I'm going to be talking today about predator-prey interactions and these are really important phenomena that occur on reefs and if any of you get the chance to spend time on a coral reef ecosystem or if you're watching things on TV, many of the things that you see or might even take for granted are actually due to the complexities that predator-prey interactions cause and how that affects animal behaviour. And to start with, we're going to look at food chains. And of course, you'll be familiar with the standard food chain here, which starts with something that's an autotroph that's harnessing the sun's energy and photosynthesizing at the base of the food chain. Here we have some phytoplankton. And then there's a, a simple relationship of energy moving up through the food chain. So from phytoplankton up to zooplankton, the zooplankton are eaten by fish, the fish are eaten by other fish, and at the top of the food chain we have top predators like a shark here. And the transfer of energy from one level to the next is an incredibly inefficient process. Typically only about 10% of the energy is actually transferred from one level to another. Okay. And for that reason, when you look at the number of different what we call trophic levels, there's usually very few, maybe no more than five, because it's an inefficient process. Now, um, pelagic food chains tend to be quite simple. You can see here there's only five species involved. If we look at a benthic system, then the complexity grows considerably, and especially if we then look at a coral reef system, it's going to become much more complicated. So if we look at a coral reef then, we start with a fairly standard food chain and all of those members of the food chain are present. But then at every single level we have a number of different species, each with their own specialisation. So now, instead of just having phytoplankton at the base of the food chain, we have seagrasses, we have algae or seaweeds, um, and so forth. And then each level, for the herbivores for example, we have turtles, as well as herbivorous fish, we have sea urchins, and then a multitude of different fish at the higher levels as well. So it's a much more complex picture. Let's look in more detail now at some of the key groups. And we're going to focus first on herbivores and what some of the principal herbivores on coral reefs are fish, like parrotfish. And what we're looking at here is a stoplight parrotfish. This is a female, it's cruising around the reef. Um, it's feeding on a small algae there that you can't quite see. It's about a foot long. And really all it's doing is it's, it's mowing down or cropping down fine algae that might only be a couple of millimetres in height. And it's grazing those down much like a lawnmower would do in, in your garden. So um, this is a very important process by which you're taking the energy that the algae is collecting from the sun and then converting that into animal protein, which is the, then forms the basis of a food chain, often with us at the top of it. Now the turnover rates are very high on these uh, reef systems. So for example, when I mentioned that that parrotfish was consuming these short algal turfs, which were only you know, this, sort of, this sort of height, those algae will regrow within one or two days. So they're very productive and they turn over rapidly. And in fact, the intensity of grazing on these reefs can be very, very high. An individual fish might take 150,000 bites every single day within one square meter of reef. So it's a very intensive process. When we look at herbivores, we often discriminate different types of herbivore on the grounds of how they feed. So for example, we might start by looking at browsers. This is an acanthurid, and it's able to feed by browsing on seaweed. So it will move across a reef and it'll just peck away at bits of seaweed. We call that browsing. Another strategy employed here by a parrotfish is to scrape, and if you look at its jaws here, it has this parrot-like beak, and it uses that to just scratch the surface of the reef and remove small amounts of algae, and it might leave a tiny little mark as it does that. But then you have even larger fish, like this bumphead parrotfish, which we call an excavator, and this has huge heavy jaws that can take a colossal bite out of the substrate, and not only are they feeding on what's living on top of the reef, but there's little microalgae inside the reef that they're also able to consume by doing this. Next, of course, we have planktivores. And typically, planktivores have to be a little bit further away from the reef in order to access the plankton. And so they're often quite vulnerable, and so they might school, as you can see here. Now, um, in addition to schooling, they have to find somewhere to hide. So if a predator does attempt to ambush them, 
then you'll tend to find like these chromis here that they have to be not too far from a refuge. And this refuge here are these branching corals that they can um, retract into if a predator becomes available. Of course, another strategy that planktivores employ is to become very large and safe. And this is, of course, the strategy that's employed by the largest fish in the ocean, the whale shark, also feeds on plankton. Now, some of the smaller planktivores have very specific um, uh, adaptations. So they might have upturned mouths. If you look at a chromis, which we can see here, it has this upturned mouth and it feeds by just grabbing plankton out of the water. They also have fairly simple colours. This one's blue, but they might be silver. And that way they present a fairly difficult target for predators to see. They sort of blend in very well. They also are very streamlined so that they can swim quickly to evade predation. Next group are invertivores. And the invertebrate prey, things like crabs or, or various sorts of gastropods, are often distributed cryptically around the reef. And if that's the case, it doesn't make sense very often to, to school and to forage as a group of fish. So typically these sorts of things are forage, are solitary foragers. What we're looking at here is a trigger fish that's feeding on its own. It's here, it's, it's removing bits of coral and looking for um, invertebrates that might be associated with that. Here's another example of a, an invertivore that's foraging alone. This is an eagle ray that's foraging for invertebrates inside a seagrass bed. Okay. Now, in some cases, invertivores have got very specialised diets. We're looking here at a French angelfish in the Caribbean, and this is specialised to feed on, on sponges. Very few things feed on sponges. And then another kind of specialisation is for fish that feed directly on corals. Here we have Oxymonacanthus, one of the most beautiful fish on a reef. Um, it's only about uh, the size of your finger and it's cruising around and it's feeding on individual coral polyps. And for that reason it has a very sort of elongated uh, mouth in order to, to target those polyps. You can also notice of course that it's incredibly well camouflaged. The spots on its side there are very similar in appearance to the sort of texture that you get on the corals that you can see that it's hiding in there. So typically um, one of the problems of being an invertivore and sort of feeding alone is that they're vulnerable to predators. So they often have other adaptations to make them less vulnerable. So typically they might have spines such as um, uh, puffer fish and armour. And another thing that you often find is that they have very strange body shapes. And that can be because they have to um, get into very specific kinds of nooks and crannies when looking for a very specific type of prey. And then lastly we have the piscivores, things that eat fish, and they have a range of different strategies too. So one strategy, such as sharks, is to be very fast and to catch things by pursuing them. And sharks, of course, are the very uh, excellent example of this. An alternative strategy is to stalk prey. Now what we're looking at here is a cornet fish, which is a very long, thin fish. And if you look in front of it, you'll see little black fish darting around. Now those are damselfish, and those are its prey and it has a very narrow body, which means it's very difficult for these damselfish to see it. It also has a very powerful tail, so when it does decide to pounce, if you like, um, it can do so very quickly and surprise the prey. And then a third strategy that piscivores employ is to ambush their prey. And this here is a scorpion fish. It's superbly camouflaged. It just looks like a piece of rock covered in seaweed. And this is lying in wait it has a very large upturned mouth and it just waits for a prey to get within striking distance, of course. So typically, uh, these sorts of uh, predators are streamlined with large mouths and they might employ camouflage uh, in order to disguise themselves from their prey.